Okay, this is the last slide that we did, right? Is this the last one we did? Yeah, so this is the last one that we did. So we completed this. And I asked you this question at the bottom, right? Yeah. Okay. So then I, on the right side of the board, I just put um, some units. So cardiac output, the units are mils per minute, stroke volume, mils per beat, heart rate beats per minute, EDV and ESV are mils. What's uh, EDV? In diastolic volume. In diastolic volume. What's diastole? Just the pause between the heart When the heart is resting, yes. And then systole is when it's contracting. Okay, good. So, stroke, the stroke volume is sometimes called the ejection volume. And they call it the ejection volume because that's the, the volume of blood that's ejected in one beat. And this is a really important clinical measurement that's associated with ejection volume or stroke volume. It's called the ejection fraction. So stroke volume or ejection volume, like we said, is the volume of blood pumped in one beat. And then you can also get, remember how you can get the stroke volume? Remember the formula for stroke volume? Maybe I should write that up there too so we get all our formulas on the board. How can you calculate the stroke volume? Stroke volume equals, there's a couple ways you could calculate the stroke volume. Well, you can derive it. I mean, if, if you say the cardiac cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate, right? Then you could. Oh, that's not the. Okay, sorry. Then you could derive it so you could go cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. If you want to get stroke volume on one side of the equation divide both sides by heart rate, right? That's one way you can get the heart, the stroke volume. What's another way you can get the stroke volume? We talked about it yesterday. Yeah, it's right up there too. Can also say stroke volume equals and diastolic volume minus and systolic volume. Got it? Okay. <clears throat> the key to having a healthy heart and know that your heart is healthy is that the heart will pump out whatever it received. And then it also says both sides pump the same volume. Now that seems counterintuitive, right? Because you'd think that the right or left side of the heart would be able to pump more blood, just intuitively. You'd think the left could pump more because it's bigger and thicker and you saw that, right? But that's not correct. Both the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, the ventricles, they pump equal volumes of blood per beat. The right side is not as thick because it doesn't have to pump the blood as far, right? Because it just has to pump the blood to the lungs. So it, it doesn't have to be as thick, but it does pump, pump the same volume of blood that the left side pumps. It's kind of weird, but that's the way it goes. Um, if you, if the right heart pumped out more, or the left heart pumped out more, you'd get edema. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then you have this concept called an ejection fraction. 
this is and I this is to see if you have a healthy heart. This is the percent of blood pumped per beat. So in our resting 70 kilogram, 21 year old male, he started with 130 mils and he pumped out, his stroke volume was 70 mils. So his ejection fraction is 54%. That just, I bet you kind of get a feel for this. Do you think your ejection fraction is gonna increase or decrease when you're exercising? It's going to increase, yeah. So if you're giving, given, if you have two identical hearts and they're given equal starting volumes in the ventricle, you can increase the percent pumped by your heart just by beating harder. And you do that when you exercise, right? But on a molecular level, how can we increase the force of contraction of our heartbeat? And that's also called contractility. How can we make, not make our heart beat faster, but how can we make our hearts beat harder? What? Yeah, that's a good answer. And, and what would those drugs or hormones do on a molecular level to the heart? And how would your force of contraction increase? What would what would be the molecular mechanism? <clears throat> Pardon me? So the Purkinje fibers will send an electrical signal to the cells to contract. But what's actually, let me ask you a different way. What's gonna make the sarcomeres contract with a greater force. Contractility. We're talking about the contractile cells in the heart. Yep, you're on the right track. You're almost there. Sympathetic uh, nervous system kicks in. The sympathetic nervous system can play a role to increase contractility. Now, you're all, you guys are all right, now just go one level down. What's happening in the world that we can't see? Increasing. The hormones will cause this contraction to, this more forceful contraction to occur. That's true. Increase in calcium and sodium. Yeah, there you go, calcium. <laughs> Increase calcium into the contractile cells. Where is calcium gonna, how is calcium gonna increase contractility? What is calcium gonna do when it gets inside a Cardiac. Bind to tropomyosin. It's going to bind to troponin tropomyosin. Troponin tropomyosin is going to move out of the way of the binding sites for myosin heads, and now more myosin heads can bind. More myosin heads binding at any one time, force the contraction of the sarcomere is greater, and then the whole muscle contracts with greater force. Yeah. later, but an epinephrine will increase uh, the opening of the calcium channels to get more calcium into the stronger force of contraction under sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Under sympathetic dioxide then? Yes. And, but, I'll go ahead and say that, but, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but parasympathetic, as far as scientists know, <clears throat> doesn't affect contractility. Parasympathetic doesn't have any effect on that. It just slows the heart rate down. But sympathetic works on heart rate and concentration. <clears throat> so if you have a diseased heart, like a lot, of, maybe your, maybe a lot of your cardiocytes in your ventricles uh, don't work well or they're dead. You've got like half of your heart is working. Then you have a diseased heart and it can't pump out the volume that it received. And then you get all sorts of trouble to talk about. So we've been, we, we did cardiac output. We talked about the whole formula. We talked about stroke volume on Monday. And now we're gonna look at heart rate. <clears throat> Why do I have this cartoon up for heart rate?
Because it's got the pacemaker. Because it's got the pacemaker, exactly. Yes, the pacemaker, right here, the pacemaker sets the heart rate. Does the pacemaker need sympathetic or parasympathetic innervation to work? No. no, it doesn't. But here's the trick. In a healthy heart, you have sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation to the pacemaker. If you cut away parasympathetic, the heart rate goes up to about 100 beats per minute and a resting 70 kilograms for normal age. So the parasympathetic innervation of the heart is actually slowing the natural rhythm of the pacemaker down. So that's why our resting heart is about 70 beats per minute. Yeah. On one of the previous slides on heart two, it said um, not um, autonomic. It's not the autonomic system. What? Oh, it should have said, hopefully it said, it doesn't need the pacemaker does not need autonomic nervous system innervation. It does. It has it, but it doesn't need it. Okay. So it doesn't need anything, right? It doesn't need anything because remember those funny sodium channels? Yeah. They just they start that potential like for your whole life. They just open. They don't need any stimulation. They don't need anybody to tell them to open. They just open. Right. And when the SA node isn't working and the AV takes over, yep. how does that affect your atrial contraction? Like, does the AV node um, become the pacemaker, then the atrium contracts, then the vent contracts? Yeah, contract, that's, or? So, what, let me see if I see what you're asking. So let's say your pacemaker dies, you don't have that, but you still have your AV node, and that has an intrinsic rhythm of about 50 beats per minute. It's going to send about 50 beats per minute. But are you asking, <clears throat> once the AV node takes over, does that still communicate with the atrial cells to tell yeah. them to contract? Yeah, I, you have um, a diagram where it showed the SA node beating, and then it showed the, the atrium AV. following, and then the AV, and then the ventricle. So oh, I does that sequence. change the sequence of... Yes. Yeah, so the SA nodes are that. So AV node is still connected to the, the atrial cardiocytes around it through gap junctions. And if, it, if this AV node can get a signal to those cardiocytes that surround it, then those cardiocytes will tell the whole, the cardiocytes in the, both atria to contract. Okay. Yeah, and if, if all those things were there, but then like if something happened, the AV, AV node worked, but it couldn't get its signal to the atrial cells, then they wouldn't contract. But that's okay, you could still live because that extra volume of blood you get from atrial contraction, um, you can live without that because it's small volume. But it would be a pretty irregular heart, right? You'd be able to hear that? No, well, hypothetically, the AV node goes at 50 beats per minute. You wouldn't be able to exercise or anything. So right. You just have to lie around in your bed. Would the stroke volume would be lower? Or? Yeah, stroke volume would be lower. Yeah. So don't smoke. Keep your SA node healthy. Don't vape. Just kidding, I don't know if vaping is Glycerin. Glycerin? Oh, okay. <coughs> heart rate. Everybody take your pulse right now. You can get your heart rate. So find it. You can find it. Well, you know where to find it. Or you can find it in your neck. Does everybody kind of know what their resting heart rate is? Mm -hmm. Is a higher or lower resting heart rate indicative of a healthy person? Lower. Lower. A lower resting heart rate, yeah. Fewer beats per minute, but the heart is nice and strong. Each beat pumps out enough blood to supply the tissues. <clears throat> so heart rate is the number of beats per minute. It's how fast the heart is beating. 
You can increase or decrease the heart rate on men. I just told you which system will increase heart rate. Which sympathetic. That means parasympathetic decreases it. Cardiovascular. Lance Armstrong, even though he's a big cheater, but he was great in dodgeball. His cameo appearance. His heart, his resting heart rate is about 32. Mine's about 30. Just kidding. <laughs> but that's pretty amazing. That's really low. That's a really strong heart. I mean, each beat of that heart is pumping out a lot of blood. Okay, we talked about typical values. And then you have this thing called the cardiac reserve. Just another formula, but it's not on the test. You get your cardiac reserve so you can do a test. Um, to find out what your cardiac reserve is. So you get your maximum cardiac output. So you probably get on a running machine or a cycling machine. Maximum cardiac output rest, minus resting cardiac output. So some, what's a resting cardiac output, first of all? Your resting heart rate. Well, rest, the, the, a value, a numerical value for the resting cardiac output. How many liters per minute for a resting? For 70 kilograms you know, that are at rest. Yeah. 30? 30 times heart rate? No, just the value of somebody at rest if you were to measure their cardiac output. That was in the. Show volume and test heart rate. That's the formula. What's. <laughs> You're all giving me the right answer. I'm just trying to figure out how to ask it. Is it 1,200? Is it 60? Minutes? No. If if you were if you put somebody if you were to measure somebody's cardiac output, what would that value be? That resting guy, that 70 kilogram male that's at rest, you can measure his cardiac output. It's blank mils per minute or blank liters per minute. What's that numerical value? Was it five? Five. Yes. Okay. About five. <clears throat> liters per minute. Now, maximum cardiac output in some athletes, they can go up to 35 liters per minute. So what's their cardiac reserve? If the formula for cardiac reserve is maximum cardiac output minus resting cardiac output. So it's 30. 35 minus 30, 35 minus five is 30 liters per minute, yeah. And in some athletes, they have, that's in, just in reserve, 30 liters per minute, that's in reserve. Most of us don't have 30 liters uh, in reserve for our cardiac <laughs> That's like <clears throat> for super athletes, like triathletes and cyclists and swimmers. <clears throat> if you have a diseased heart, you might not have any cardiac reserve. So you can't exercise. Yeah. Does that mean you miswrote your cardiac output unit? <clears throat> it's supposed to be liters per minute instead of milliliters per minute? Oh, I didn't, I didn't miswrite it. I could have put liters or milliliters. So. But that's a good point. Let's do a little fun math. 1,000. Cardiac output, a resting cardiac output would be five liters per minute or five. how many five. mils per minute? 5,000. 5,000 mils. No. Yeah. yeah. And it just depends like on the test, you know, if I give the, if I give it to you in milliliters, like some values, that, I, don't, I don't think that would be that tricky to give some values in mils and some values in liters and make you convert. <laughs> Hope I'm not that tricky. I'll double check though. So I don't want you to have to do math on the test. Awful. Okay. This reminds me of the story of the three bears. You know how the porridge was too hot, too cold, and then the porridge was just right? Well, it's the story of the sarcomere. <laughs> so this is a review of the length tension curve of skeletal muscle. And then also, there's a giant sarcomere in the back. You guys want Turn around, see, I'm pointing at it. See the giant sarcomere? That costs like, I don't know how it felt, $1,700 <laughs> or something. So you should look at that. It's pretty cool though to just see how the sarcomere moves. 
So this is, and I know you studied this in 201, but you have to understand, the, you have to re-understand how this works to think about how cardiac muscle works. So in um, skeletal muscle, <clears throat> this is a, the resting length of the skeletal muscle. Now, look at the myosin heads. See how every single myosin head on myosin <clears throat> is gonna be able to find a myosin head binding spot on actin, right? So when the reaction starts, each one of these myosin heads are gonna cross cycle and bring the sarcomere, the two Z bits closer together, the sarcomere is gonna shorten and you'll get an optimal contraction if you start here with your sarcomeres. <clears throat> but check it out, what if you start with your sarcomeres all squinched up? How much further are they gonna be able to contract? Not very. Not much, cause look, Myosin's gonna butt up against the Z line, so they're only gonna get a little bit of contraction. Whereas these guys, check, they're gonna get nice full contraction. Does that make sense? And then what if your sarcomeres were too stretched out? <clears throat> so even though these myosin heads are working hard, they're cycling and everything, they can't grab onto any myosin head binding sites on actin. So if you have this in mind, and I can show you this length tension curve. This is from 201. I think I only just, I might not have even shown it or talked about it very long. But you have tension or percent of maximum. That's supposed to say maximum. Oh, I cut that off. Okay. So 100% of the tension or force that you could generate, you will generate when your sarcomeres start here. If your sarcomeres start here, you can only generate about 75% of your optimal force of contraction. Here, um, let's see, sarcomeres excessively stretched out here, percent, oh, wait a sec, wait a sec. No, that's right. It's like 25%. Pardon me? It looks like it's down in like the 25%. Yeah, come over here. 15. Yeah, it's a little, yeah, so here's about 25%, so even, yeah, less than 25% of what you could actually generate. So this is the way it looks. This looks this way for skeletal muscle. But cardiac muscle has sarcomeres too, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the trick with <laughs> cardiac muscle. In a resting ventricle, you guys know the ventricle, that, remember that thick wall that you cut open, that's full of cardiac contractile cells, and those cardiac contractile cells are full of sarcomeres, right? So when your ventricles are at rest, the sarcomeres in the cardiac contractile cells look like that. Then what's gonna happen as your ventricles start to get full? Are your cardiac contractile cells gonna stretch a little bit? Yeah, they are. And when they stretch, their sarcomeres are going to stretch to optimal length. When they get to optimal length, now, boom, when they contract, they can eject that blood like they're supposed to. So here's cardiac muscle at rest. Here's cardiac muscle stretched due to filling of the ventricles. So you, you, unlike skeletal muscle, which is at optimal length, skeletal muscle is at optimal length, this bottom panel, when it's at rest, you have to stretch your cardiac muscle to optimal length. And since you can't just get in there and go, oh, stretch cardiac muscle, the way your cardiac muscle stretches is it fills, the ventricles fill up with blood. And that stretches the ventricles, that stretches the cells, that stretches the sarcomeres. And once you get this optimal overlap of actin and myosin, then you can have an optimal force of contraction, which is what you want for your ventricle, right? You want it to contract optimally to eject that blood. You see the steps? Mm -hmm. Sort of. <coughs> <coughs> so. Skeletal muscle, you 
can really forcefully contract your bicep or you can not very forcefully contract your bicep. That's called grading of contraction of a muscle. So one way to grade the contraction of the muscle, you can vary the length of the muscle fiber and thus the sarcoid. How do you how do you vary the length of the muscle fibers in the heart? Ask if it's pump more blood. Pardon me? Exercise? Ask if it's pump more blood. You're on the right. Yeah, that's and it will pump more blood, but how do you get how do you vary the length of the muscle fiber in your heart? So now we're talking about a cardiac muscle cell. How do you vary, how do you get it to be longer or shorter? I'm trying to get a different way I could ask this, because the answer is what we just talked about on the previous slide. Oh, oh darn it, I forgot you. Makes that so genius -y. Like how you talk about volume, increasing volume in the ventricles, stretches, the cardiac muscle cells that stretch into the sarcoma. How do you do this in the heart? How do you vary the length of the muscle fibers? Do you put more or less blood in the ventricles? But then you're on the right track because you're gonna put more blood in the ventricles when you exercise. So, another way to grade the force and contraction of a muscle is to vary the calcium concentration. Now, we talked about this earlier, you guys told me a couple ways that you can increase the amount of calcium in the heart. Well, one way for sure. Well, drugs and sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system is going to increase the amount of calcium that goes into the muscle cells. Sympathetic, yeah. <coughs> so there's two ways that you can grade the force of contraction in your heart. You can vary the length of the muscle, cardiac muscle cells. You do that by increasing or decreasing the volume. And then you can also increase the amount of calcium. Sympathetic nervous system, what's, its, what's the hormone released by the sympathetic nervous system? Yeah, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So if nora, if you, let's say you're in a sympathetic nervous system situation. So, the terrorists that are on Kill's community campus. The terrorists are here. Sympathetic nervous system goes up. Epinephrine is released. Epinephrine's flowing all over your body. Epinephrine finds a place to bind in the heart. Epinephrine's gonna open, it's gonna manipulate calcium and allow more calcium to come in. So where's epinephrine gonna bind? It will, yes, the calcium-gated calcium channels and the voltage-gated calcium channels. Epinephrine's gonna bind to those calcium channels and more calcium's gonna get into the muscle cell. Remember that cartoon? You know, sometimes I feel like I have all these cartoons in my head and then I, I just think you guys have them in there too. Let's see. Where's my... A cartoon I had in my head. Sympathetic nervous system is activated. Epinephrine binds to the voltage-gated calcium channel, the calcium-gated or ligand-gated calcium channel. Calcium now is flooding into the sarcomeres, the muscle cells in your heart. Now there's a buttload of calcium, buttload of trop troponin tropomyosin moves out of the way. Lots of myosin heads can bind and cross-cycle, and you get it shortening of the sarcomere, shortening of the uh, heart, you get a contraction. I love doing the, what did I see? I must have seen this for myosin head. I always go like this, and then I probably, do I look stupid, kind of? No. Oh, I look, remember when Donald Trump made fun of that reporter? Does anybody remember that? <laughs> and he's up there making, I hope I don't look that way. Because <laughs> what? <laughs> What I'm thinking is like, here's a myosin head. This mic goes, it binds to a myosin head binding site. Here's actin. And then when it moves, 
it causes the whole sarcomere to get shorter. So when I go like this, I must have seen it in a video or something. I see it all the time. I don't know if I've Okay, so questions on that? Did you guys get that story? Hopefully. Let's introduce some fun terms now that you've got that down. Preload. Now just remember, if there's a preload, there's going to be a afterload. After <laughs> yeah. So the preload is a pressure measurement. Now this gets a little tricky, but preload is a pressure that is associated with the volume of blood in the ventricle. So if you have a volume of liquid anywhere, that volume of liquid has a pressure associated with it. Yeah, like have you heard, um, like if someone gets a head injury and the fluid is leaking on the brain, it puts pressure on the brain, that fluid is putting pressure on the brain, right? That's pathologic. So anytime you have fluid anywhere, there's pressure associated with it. So there, and, and what's the, in the ventricles, what's it called? What's that volume measurement called at the end of uh, systole? Yes. And systolic volume, and then at the end of diastole, EDV. and diastolic volume. So the preload is related to the end diastolic volume. So at the end of diastole, do you have a lot of blood in your heart at the end of diastole? Or do you have more blood in your ventricles at the end of systole? More blood in your heart at the end of diastole. Yeah. So your heart is relaxed, it's filling up, it's got a certain volume associated with it. With that volume, there is an associated pressure called the preload. So now with those two concepts in mind, we can introduce, so these are the, this Frank Starling Law of the Heart. This is the last name of these two guys or two gals, I'm not sure if it's two guys or gals, but Frank Starling Law, the greater the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole, the greater the stroke volume you're going to get during systole, because as you put more and more blood in the ventricles, these sarcomeres are gonna more and more stretch to optimal length. So this would be this would be a cartoon of the sarcomeres in a ventricle that's optimally full with blood. Oh, I don't think I introduced this term, LO. That's optimal length. That's math ease for optimal length. So imagine the top panel, your heart's at rest, and then down here it shows the ventricles are filling with blood, so it's a process. As the ventricles fill with blood, what's going to happen to this top sarcomere? Are these two black Z lines going to get further apart or are they going to get closer, closer together? They're going to get further apart until, say you're exercising, you get the maximum volume of blood in your ventricles then the sarcomeres and the muscle cells are gonna look like this. So the Frank Starling law, mathematically then, stroke volume is proportional to end diastolic volume. That's not saying the stroke volume is equal to the end diastolic volume. That means it's proportional. Now what does that mean in math ease? What does a proportion tell you? Exactly, exactly. If it's a direct proportion, as one measurement goes up, the other goes up as well. What if it's an indirect proportion? Yeah, if one measurement goes up, the other measurement goes down. So Frank Starling Law says that stroke volume is proportional to the end diastolic volume. So as you get more and more blood in your heart at the end of diastole, the end diastolic volume, that means you're gonna eject more blood when you do a stroke volume. Isn't that fun to think about? <laughs> no? It's 
if I still think it's so wonderful. <laughs> Any questions on Frank Starling Law of the Heart? <coughs> so the blood volume that comes in is going to equal the blood volume that comes out. So what this means is if I'm exercising and more blood is coming back to my heart, that means more blood's going to get pumped out of my heart. The amount of blood that comes in is equal to the amount that's going to get pumped out. It, but remember, you always have that 60 mils that's sitting in the tank. Yeah. So we got equals, and then we have proportional. So why isn't proportional equal? Oh, yeah. When you I went should, through proportional, I should have put a proportionality said, symbol yeah, not in there. Equal. Yeah, I better put proportionality in there. There you go. How about that? Yeah. Does anybody else have a favorite math proportionality symbol? Is this one good? Okay. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I just noticed that too. That's right. If I'm going to be a math leap, I've got to get my game on. Clearly, I'm not a math leap, but. Okay, good. Thank you. So this is a cartoon of preload. We just talked about that. And see this, the dark solid line here? That's the heart as it begins to fill with blood. And then look, as more and more blood comes in, you see here's, a, here's one set of dotted lines. The ventricle volume is getting bigger, and then here's another set of dotted lines. So as the ventricular volume gets bigger and bigger, what's happening to those cells that live inside the ventricle, the wall of the ventricle? Stretching. They're getting stretched, and their sarcomeres are getting stretched. Okay. And here's a cartoon of a graph. It's got stroke volume on the y-axis and end diastolic volume on the x-axis. So it just shows here for any end diastolic volume, there's a corresponding stroke volume. Look what happens here. If the end diastolic volume goes up, what's going to happen to the stroke volume? It's going to go up. And then if you ever take like a 900 level cardiac physiology class, you can construct these graphs and graphs and do a bunch of math on them. But if not, then we'll stop here. Does anybody have any questions on this? Do you see how the sarcomeres are stre stretched to optimal length up here? Give you the maximal stroke volume. <laughs> and I already said this. But I'm just putting up it up again. So you can read it twice. Questions on Frank Starling Law. Let me see. And then we have to do and then we get to do. Do you want to take a break now or do you want to guts it out and then take a break at the end? Do you need a break now? Yeah, you do. Because you're not answering the questions. Or maybe.